Hello, it's Jim Brown with the illustrations for Chapter 6 of my book, Among the Multihulls, 14 Minutes. This chapter is about the cultural context from which the modern multihull emerged. It was that same culture that brought us the beach cat, the Hobie cat of the 1960s. But the beach catamaran concept actually began in the mid-1940s with Woody Brown's beautiful 38-foot Manukai, the real pioneer. This is a sister ship to the original Manukai, these pictures taken in 2004. And you can imagine what this kind of sailing was like for the monohull people of the 1940s. It was beyond human experience. It was just another part of that post-war can-do-anything confidence that emerged during that period. Just watch this thing as it catches a gust and takes off. Designed 60 years ago by Woody Brown of Hawaii. The sailing world would never be the same again. And a guy named Hobie Alter sailed in that original Manukai in the 1950s and came back and designed the Hobie 14. And the beach cat phenomenon was on. And the first real catamaran yachts also originated in Hawaii with the work of Rudy Choi. But the seafaring catamaran for owner building originated with James Warham's work in the mid-1950s. They were comparatively crude, as were the early trimarans for owner building. You've heard about my Wana from the previous chapters. Her coastal voyage was in 1959. But the seafaring trimaran for owner building didn't really kick off until 1960 when Arthur Piver crossed the Atlantic in his 30-foot nimble. All of a sudden, people started whacking out trimarans in all kinds of places, and they always attracted a crowd. They would drive you nuts when trying to work. There's a story in the book about my friend Joe Hudson, who built his boat on a mountainside in Big Sur, and managed to launch it down this road to that surf below, from where he eventually sailed to Australia. A great many of the owner-built multi-hulls of the day were hideously modified by their owners and, of course, never really went anywhere. For their owners, it was all about the fantasy. This one, the Nomel, actually had her outriggers made of dugout canoes, and she did a lot of seafaring, so it depended on the guy, and in many cases, the gal that sailed with him. But many of the early multi-hulls were terribly overloaded, and they developed this interplay wave-making between the hulls, which really made them have poor performance. And in the early 60s, I began to have design ideas, and this was my model basin. And my great dog, Bosco, was, among many other things, my strain gauge. And with the help of my friend Don McQueen, I had my first chances to dabble in design with this 40-foot piver design, which I modified. But then in 1963, I hung out my shingle as a designer, and this was the first boat that I designed from scratch, the 38-foot off soundings. And she was built by my late great friend, Mark Hassel, who has a long story to be told. We'll just tell a little of it here. Look at the intensity in this guy's eyes. Mark built three of my boats, one of which he lost in a shipwreck, the other two he sailed around the world. The chapter tells of the launching of his first one, the 38-footer, which we actually pushed out through the surf and sailed from a position hard aground into open water. But in the process, we broke the fin off of one of the floats and had to haul her out the next day and fix that fin. And this is the boat that he would lose in the shipwreck only eight months later. 
As the result of an anchoring predicament, Mark and his new friend, Bonnie, stacked up the boat on Anacapa Island, which is almost as steep as is shown here in the Joe Hudson cartoon, and they were shipwrecked for a week on this island, and it was Bonnie's first cruise. My next design was the 34-foot Manta, in which we did a lot of family knocking around. It was built by friends Jim and Barbara McCaig. These boats were very piver-like, a little leaner, a little wider, a little faster. And of course, by the mid-1960s, there were several other designers that were working on the same progression. It was in one of these boats that the book tells the story of Pops the Pagan Priest, and there he is in the foreground on the helm. We're halfway to Hawaii, having a little celebration, and poor Pops is not allowed to look at the Playboy centerfold. All he could say was, it's not fair. And this was Caravelle, my first and only racing trimaran design, and she could really go. See her rooster tail? She's the star of the story of our race with Angelita. Well, all of those boats were just practice lead up to my eventual Sea Runner series that featured these deep swing centerboards in the main hull shown in this model. And the boats also featured a central cockpit, which can be seen here placed over the centerboard trunk, a unique arrangement at the time. Many of these boats were built by their owners and sailed a long way. Here's a giant manta ray showing us its wing tip, and this animal would become the inspiration for the Sea Runner sail emblem and logo that we call the Flying Whale. This graphic would become my autograph, really. We'll think of it as a symbol of the flying, swimming, buoyant times in which the modern multi-hull emerged. There it is on the sail of a sea runner playing in the Willowas underneath Mount Pele in Hawaii. And here's the same boat snuggled in among the houseboats in Sausalito. This is Tattoo, built and sailed by Mr. Brent Whipple on several Pacific passages. So by the late 60s, boy, there were trimarans coming out over the treetops, having been built by their owners in their backyard. And there were many other designers experiencing the same kind of frenzied activity. Some of us learned our seamanship the hard way. This boat had been stacked up on jetty rock in a heavy surf. All three hulls ripped open. At least we knew that they were not going to sink. Well, this is the 37-foot sea runner built by Mark and Bonnie Hassel which they subsequently sailed around the world after they lost their first boat in the shipwreck. But Mark would eventually circumnavigate again in another trimaran, and that's another story for another time. But Mark would eventually swallow the anchor, as the saying goes, and move ashore to settle in a little Indian village on the shores of this beautiful lake Atitlan in Guatemala, where I caught up with him in the early 2000s. We talked a lot about our lifelong commitments to multi-hull sailing, and among many other things, Mark had this to say about it. The freedom of moving around the world in our own home, you know. It's not like visiting from one place to another and you stay in a hotel and you're a tourist. I lived in these places. I lived in the Solomon Islands. I've lived in Australia and Africa and many, many other places because I'm living in my boat. Well, like many of my clients, uh, Mark was always operating on a shoestring. And I asked him, what's it been like, Mark, for you to make your way through life scrounging all the way? And he said that question was best answered by something that Sterling Hayden had written back in the 1960s. He said, come on in, let me read it for you. To be truly challenging, a voyage like a life must rest on a firm foundation of financial unrest. 
Otherwise, you are doomed to a routine traverse, the kind known to yachtsmen who play with their boats at sea. Cruising, it is called. Voyaging belongs to seamen and to the wonders of the world who cannot or will not fit in. If you are contemplating a voyage and you have the means, abandon the venture until your fortunes change. Only then will you know what the sea is all about. I've always wanted to sail the South Seas, but I can't afford it. What these men can't afford is not to go. They are enmeshed in the cancerous discipline of security, and in the worship of security we fling our lives beneath the wheels of routine. But we are brainwashed by our economic system until we end up in a tomb beneath a pyramid of time payments, mortgages, prosperity, gadgetry, playthings that divert our attention from the sheer idiocy of the charade. The years thunder by, the dreams of youth grow dim, where they lie cracked in the dust on the shelves of patience. Before we know it, the tomb is sealed. Where then lies the answer? In choice. Which shall it be? Bankruptcy of purse or bankruptcy of life? Well, Mark Hessel certainly was not the only guy to personify the context from which modern multi-hulls emerged. This is my old friend Walt Glazer. Do you remember Walt from the very beginning of Chapter 1? Well, Walter designed the Sally Lightfoot trimorans of the mid-1960s, but he was a very creative guy in other ways. Ladies and gentlemen, meet Arnold Carruthers. Mr. Carruthers is a fictional cartoon character created in verse by Walt Glazer and drawn here by Joe Hudson. And yes, he would become Hudson's fabulous Zachary Bone. Trimoran magazine published several pages of these views together with Walter's verse sometime in the late 60s. I don't suppose you can see the verse, so I'll try to read it for you. When I was a kid, I used to dream about this sort of thing, about a tiny double outrigger called Sally Lightfoot, and about all the faraway islands and great open blueness of the South Pacific. And now it's happening. God damn it, it's happening, and it's true, and we're here. Me and Sally have made it. I'm telling you, when a man has the kind of fantasies that I've had all my life, he's finally got to do something about it. Seventy-three years is nothing. It's yesterday. It's the most it is. Everything is today. And today is Arnold Carruthers and Sally Lightfoot 800 miles outward bound for the Marquesas. We're sweeping south in the warm, steady trades, and nothing can stop us or hurt us. We've thought about it too long. We know what we're doing. We are as one. We know how to go out and kick an anchovy right in the face. We sing a song you've never heard of. Well, that was Scrimshaw sailing there, and it's Scrimshaw's story from here on. Yeah, so much for the multi-hull context. In Chapter 7 coming up now, we're going to pick up the story where we left the Brown family hanging on the edge of that precipice at the end of Chapter 1. Hope to see you there. <laughs>